I'm in. Hello, can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Give me a sign if anybody can hear me out there. It's like a seance. Emily, if you can hear me, make a sign. Hey, Jeff. This is very bizarre because you guys are typing to me and I'm, uh, I'm talking. It's like the anti-Zoom. Celebrating release day. Hey, Carl, how you doing? Gavin, nice to see you. Or to read your text. You, good, that's good. There you go. Water. East London water. That's how we celebrate here. We had a few technical issues getting in. Oh, I've got a question already from Rick. All right, Bo. Um, Matt's posting here. How are you going to do all the extra keys and Vox at live gigs next year? That, Rick, is a really good question. <laughs> hey, Graham, how's it going? Um, we're kind of uh, working out how to best represent the album live. Um, so that's you know i mean one of the, the the good things about the album is there's so many different sort of sounds and textures going on in it that it doesn't you know what i mean there's the we've got like sounds that are kind of like really identifiable with part of the song and we'll keep those but there's some parts that we can transpose onto guitar or vice versa um but i think the the main thing is to keep the uh you know keep the vibe of the the, the pieces going so yeah that's uh that's a work in progress and i yeah, with cowbells, loads of cowbells, boy. More cowbells. <laughs> I think I kind of answered it. It's uh, anybody that knows us will know that when we play live, it's never a you know a, a, an exact representation of uh, of the of the records. It's uh, it's kind of our live interpretation of it because that's what we do when we play live. We we're you know, loud and noisy and stuff, you know, so I think I'm really excited about it, really excited about it. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's really exciting. I think the rest of the band are as well. Let's see what else we got in here. <laughs> Gavin's asked, how are we going to get all those backing singers onto the stage at the Black Heart? That's a very good question. <laughs> not quite sure yet we'll, 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 we'll work it out it'll be fine we'll just pass microphones around the audience by then everybody will know the words right you're all learning them <laughs> that's something you're quite interested to see actually because it's having lyrics now you, yeah that's a good idea use a TARDIS the obvious answer having lyrics now um yeah i'm looking forward to a few sing-alongs eh <laughs> that's backing tapes of that <laughs> yeah we've got an old walkman you got to try and uh, hope it all keeps up with us uh gary jones oh uh, hi james uh vocals on the last track are amazing oh thank you very much how many takes did you do to nail it i'm yeah you would not believe <laughs> it wasn't a case of um getting it right it or you know working out the melody um it was a case of uh you know we've been we've been as we are for like 10 years and then it was really important that the vocals fit the music and not the other way around that this that's that's how it was the vocals were another instrument so there was a lot of experimentations because i mean i don't know how many of you guys out there are singers and stuff but 
how you pronounce words and the emphasis you put on something can really change the the tone of it and how it comes across. So there's a lot of that, you know, um, I know Matt will, if anybody talks to Matt, um, you know, he'll tell you that there's a lot of backwards and forwards with, uh, you know, I could sing it a bit like this or I could sing it a bit like that. So yeah, it wasn't so much as uh, loads of takes. It was more a case of getting the tone right, getting the right, making it sit in properly. What else we got here? Uh, Chris, probably been asked for, did you always know you could sing? Um, well, when me and Matt and Stuart were in bands way back when, because we've been in bands together since we were like 14 years old, um, I used to be the singer, for better or for worse. Um, and so, yeah. And it, yeah, so I, I just always used to sing. But this, it was quite weird because I haven't done that in any kind of like serious with any serious intention for like over 10 years. Uh, so uh, yeah, exactly, Carl remembers. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Carl. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was a bit nerve wracking to try and add something, you know. Will there be vocals? Uh, those lyrics are a bit tougher than palm trees. Yeah, you really have to study. Uh, will there be vocals in Album 5 or vocals? Something? I think so, yeah. Because it's, you know, it's something we've really enjoyed doing. And it's given us a new kind of um, a new boost. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, we're hoping to uh, do a bit more of that. I don't know, just different things. We're always, you know, thinking of ways that we can amuse ourselves and keep ourselves interested. So, you know, it's not uh, none of this stuff is ideological. It's just, you know, whatever, whatever kind of works or what, you know, we might uh, write something that we, that we decide not to, but it's definitely something we're enjoying at the moment. Uh, what does the album sound like on vinyl? Well, I've had the, uh, we're waiting for the vinyl to turn up, but I've had the, the test pressings, which I had to check and, and it sounded really good. So yeah, <laughs> great. Ian Bradley, vocals sound great, not too American. Oh, you, th what I was saying earlier, all the different takes, the, the amount of times you can sit there and go, Oh, I don't, you know, whereabouts in the Atlantic you are. And it's not for anything. A lot of words just come out with like this kind of twang to them. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you're trying to, you're constantly traveling across the Atlantic, trying to work out where the cringe level is. You don't want to go like full, you know, um, full on American, but, you know, somewhere, somewhere slightly, Slightly east of Elton John. But you also don't want to go, you know, uh, knees up Mother Brown either. What's on the shelf behind me? Um, that one up there, there's various um, vinyl pops. What is that what they're called? Yeah. Up there. We've got loads of different ones up there. And then, uh, you know, some pictures of The Cure and Patti Smith and things like that as well. Uh, what are the chance of Matt doing some vocals? Well, you'd have to ask Matt on that one you know i'm i'm for it i'm for all of them you know i keep trying to pass the microphone around <laughs> we'll have to start a petition to get matt on the uh, lead vocals maybe we could do like like kiss we could all do an album where we all do lead vocals on it that's a good idea <laughs> matt says none <laughs> we'll work on it uh, Rick says, what will you do about the extra keys in live shows? I, I was talking about this earlier, Rick. It's, it's, there's obviously there's melody lines that, you know, we're, we're kind of like tied to because they're a huge part of the song, but really it's in the rehearsal rooms. It's about creating the same ideas and the same atmosphere. So we're not married to, you know, all those different parts. And some of them we're transposing onto guitars, um, or vice versa, and just kind of whatever works to give the same impression, you know? Um, because we don't have that many hands. And, and when we were writing the record, that was one of the things, because because it was written all during COVID and everything, and it was a case of like, let's just do whatever works. We weren't thinking of, oh, well, we, we can't put that on because there's you know that's not right. And it was just, let's do it, because we're relatively comfortable with interpreting stuff live. Graham says, uh, production on the album is really good. Oh, thank you, Graham. Love the sound. Thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah, it's something we spent a lot of time on. Um, 
and a lot of care about as well a lot of thought we did a lot of um a lot of production pre-production work this time round um which we've never had the opportunity to do and because of covid as well we were able to and we were all separated in various parts of the country it's the first time we were actually sending parts to each other um so for example stuart could go away for a week or two weeks or however long he wanted um and yeah and and kind of work on the parts without somebody tuning up a guitar or trying out pedals or something in the in the background and vice versa you know the same we were able to really concentrate on it and get you know kind of get into the 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 nuts and bolts something we've never had the chance to do before jeff mumford will you be performing the entire gear album in order at the gig in camden um we haven't quite decided yet i think we're we're definitely playing the whole album um and it's fun because we've got you know obviously quite a big relatively big back catalogue now as well so it's fun kind of putting these new songs in around old stuff um and i think there's going to be yeah i don't think we'll play it like directly in order we're not decided yet we might do but um it's quite fun to kind of put some of the other tracks in between um and it kind of gives everything a bit of a new lease of life i think anyway you may all disagree but that's what we think um Ricky said, no Geddy Lee stuff then. Well, yeah, you know what? Um, I have a new level of respect for Geddy Lee, uh, Phil Linnett. Anybody who sings and plays bass, you know, uh, yeah, that's that's hard. I mean, guitar is singing. What's that? Strummy, strummy, sing the line. <laughs> On bass guitar, you've got to be in time and everything. So, yeah, that's it's it's been a, a, a new set of skills I've had to learn. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Gavin lent on the keyboard. I know, here we go. Nostalgia now is a great album closer. The more I listen to the start, the more I think it would have been an epic way to finish the album. Was it difficult to decide on the running order? Um, there was a few times where it kind of went backwards and forwards. Um, but the start was kind of almost conceived as a way to start. Um and it just kind of went there. There was a there was a point where um, there was actually a point when Nostalgia Now was the first the first one on the record, um, but but bizarrely, as the as the kind of like the mix is all finished, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but we were all kind of like this is this is how it is. As eight songs, they just kind of rolled from one into the other, and um, you know I know it was me, Matt, and uh, Stephen Stewart all spoke about the one of our favorite bits of the album is the way it rolls from the start into shake the jar um yeah so yeah there was a bit of shuffling around but i think it kind of it became quite obvious to us um any shot steve fincham any chance of you guys coming up north uh watch this space that's all i'm saying um ian bradley when writing new stuff did any begin with keys yes um because the way we wrote it, this this album, which we've never done like this before, um, because we were all separated because of COVID, um, there was a lot of file sharing. So there'd be, um, you know, a, a guitar loop or there'd be uh, some, you know, keyboard chords or something that we'd send to each other. And sometimes we'd change that into guitar parts and vice versa. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them started, you know, um, as completely as, as keyboard things that we kind of built up on. Um, Des is here, Rosalind Massive, NN10 Forever. Exactly. For those of you who don't know, Derek in the, is uh, from the Orange Clocks, back from our hometown in Rosalind, where we all grew up together. <laughs> Brad Eye, the start is the perfect opening track. I mean, it was called The Start. Come on. What, what else can you do, you know? Ian Bradley. Yes, I'm glad you agree. Yes, starting to shake the jar is brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it seemed very obvious once we'd done it. It seemed very obvious. Interestingly, the start was called the start. We, whenever we write songs before we have all the music was written before the, the, the lyrics. And that's we've always given songs kind of like just names. Sometimes the names are, you know, just whatever comes to mind at the time. Um, and but the start, even before the lyrics were written, was always called the start. 
um graham harris really enjoying the bonus track cds there's some great stuff there thank you it it felt like um the for those who don't know uh the bonus cd has um what we're calling the purest mixes basically the instrumentals and um a lot of uh bits and bobs so so there's uh you know a, a demo on there um which i think some people might enjoy hearing because it's it's a version of shake the jar that's got some different stuff on it quite a different sound on it as well um that was like a, a, a you know a working kind of model and there's a few live tracks on there as well um uh, you know uh from uh two days prog in italy we did a, there's a, tr a version of wonderful on there but it's interesting because we were taking these songs out and playing them at a few of these gigs and festivals before they were on the record so there's an element of still trying to work it out in bradley big up the rushton massive absolutely it's a great place <laughs> Cheers. I've got my storyteller chair and everything. Ugh. I'll read you all the story in a bit. Jack and Ori. Uh, Gary Jones, other backing vocalists on different tracks. How are they arranged? So, um, our good friend Tom Hunt, who's from also from the Orange Clocks, um, he's uh, the most featured backing vocalist. Um, so he appears on uh, "Shake the Jar" and "The Start," um, and there's another track but I can't quite remember. And then we have um, some very talented friends um, who provided the kind of like the the choir on um the start as well so uh but most of the other ones are me um doing the backing vocals as well because i couldn't resist uh darren landrum i just listened to the al new album really enjoying it so far oh excellent that's good news phew <laughs> rick easton i felt a bit of stephen wilson vibe at the beginning of nostalgia now were you consciously being influenced by other artists in any way um Yes, but maybe not in the. It's quite. It's quite. It's always really interesting with um, when people talk about influences and you know when they hear things in songs because I really like it when people hear whatever they you know whatever they feel comfortable with and you know if somebody says it sounds like something that I don't even like you know I still take it as a compliment because if it's something they like then they mean it as a compliment you know but. Um, sometimes our the, the way we get influences are a little bit abstract so um basically it's just weird influences so for example like on nostalgia now the drum beat um and matt came up with that guitar line that guitar melody and i was thinking of um I've completely forgotten the guy's name wichita line man because it was played on the baritone guitar so it had this kind of vibe to it um um and um the drum part was uh, actually influenced by, there's a, a live version of an Oscar Peterson track. I can't remember the name of that one either, but that was, yeah, the drums on that were played with like beaters and this kind of very, you know, minimalist kind of way. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, sometimes they, they all come in from different directions and, you know, it all kind of melts into one thing. There was never a, it's all it's all little bits you put together all different ingredients there wasn't there was never a really like oh okay this sounds like this now you know let's let's go with that uh tom hunt there he is tom hunt backing vocalist extraordinaire um hey dave you're right dave woodcock south end celebrity should all go and listen to him as well he's amazing um for, uh, Matt Stevens from Martin Kielty trying to ask Kevin if it's a concept album by the Christian won't go and can you help <laughs> there you go is it a concept album um no but they were all written at a time where there was yeah there was certain kind of like um ideas that kind of flowed into one another so there's no there you know it's not a, a story but I think it's definitely a snapshot of a kind of quite a a weird time in society and technology and you know and all this kind of stuff and really 
I'm not a good enough, you know, well, you know, all of us kind of like help write the lyrics and none of us are good enough to be, you know, uh, particularly clever with lyrics, but we want people to be able to, Glenn Campbell, Wichita Lineman, but we want um, people to be able to take what they want, you know, from it, because um, I think that's more fun. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not, we didn't want to be, you know, um, old men shaking our fist at the, the future saying it's not like the old days, because that's not what we're about at all. But it, but I think a lot of the stuff that's happening in the in the world and society and things like that, um, yeah, it bears comment. Um, Jeff Mumford, yes, that, yeah, Glenn Campbell, yeah, good, we confirmed Glenn Campbell. That's the one. Uh, how different are the songs now from their original inception, uh, Jeff? Um, some not at all. Others completely uh, like nothing like them. Um, and a lot of that was because of, you know, the change in sounds. So um, Photogenic Love um, was originally, um, Matt sent me that as a piano piece. Um, and then we kind of, you know, added the bass line and everything else around it. And, you know, uh, so, yeah, it, it started out with a completely different feel to it. Um, trying to think of uh, some of the other ones that non-player was always kind of very much as it is we that's one of the ones that before covid would actually started writing same as golden thread um uh yeah but it, i'd say that was the, the the one that was the most different photogenic love uh yeah you're welcome dave <laughs> uh jay all right jay it's an incredibly good album chaps top work thank you very much very much appreciated. Yeah, we just, you know, we put a lot of love into it and I think it shows and I'm I'm hoping that people can get some use out of it, you know? It's a, uh, we wanted to kind of, you know, build a world with the sound so that you can kind of, you know, go and visit it whenever you want and find something new in there every time, you know? I, they're the kind of albums I like, you know? We love, you know, like um, bands like the Flaming Lips, and you know, um, uh, you know where there's a, there's a real, you know, novelty is the wrong word, but you know where the production is like, you know, it's different on everything, and you know, there's always something else going on. Jim Knight, listen to the album on the Bandcamp with a mix of excitement, trepidation, excitement is justified, and trepidation definitely not. The album is wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, from mine that's a fascinating answer too we'll have lots to talk about i haven't for a second thought it was about old men shaking their fists at the future i think it's young men shaking their fists at the past <laughs> well yeah somewhere in between yeah i think um i like the idea of um this kind of you know um being a kind of like commentator i like i like that idea of you know talking about these things i mean there's obviously a song like shake the jar which I don't know how many of you managed to delve into the lyrics yet, but that's obviously, you know, um, that was written very, the lyrics of that were written very quickly and in, in in a state of anger with things in the world. So, yeah. Um, all right, Daz, how's it going? Darren's here from, uh, from the Mighty Stormbringer. Uh, Brad, is there a need to comment on the state of the COVID world? What led you to write in the vocals or was that already decided? Um, you know what? Here's, here's the thing that's interesting because I don't know if anybody's really noticed or we've ever spoken to anybody about all the instrumental albums, the way we name them. The way we name the, the songs has always been around conversations we've been having. And I don't know if anybody else gets this but you know obviously there's you know four of us and you know our, our circle of friends around us we um we just talk about stuff and there tends to be a kind of a theme to things so for example spooky action at that point this is going to sound so geeky but we were talking a lot about uh physics and reality and how those things all fit together so that's where you get you know um the title spooky action you get entropy you get, um, you know, let's start a cult, you know, all these kind of ideas. I mean, some some of the titles are just, oh, that word looks cool. But yeah, there's always this kind of idea. So this album's kind of no different, you know, it's just something that was, you know, in the ether. Sorry, that's a really bad answer. 
<laughs> but I hope that's something. Uh, Jeff Mumford, your fan base has grown considerably recently. Are you prepared for the leap up to the popularity with this album? I, I don't know how to answer that. Let's see. I mean, yeah, it's it's very it's always very hard to kind of ascertain where you are and what's happening. I mean, for us, it's never been about you know. We're very realistic and we're very aware of what where we stand on these things. And obviously, for us, we want people to hear our music. That's that's it. We just want people to hear our music. And if we can, you know, sell enough stuff so that we can keep doing it without bankrupting ourselves or anything like that then perfect you know so yeah that's great and obviously you know doing the gigs we just want people to come and have fun and the more people that can come and have fun the better so yeah let's let's see um jim knight how about a gig in edinburgh with the orange clock to support uh, mate absolutely yeah let's let's go let's get it sorted out that'd be one hell of a tour bus <laughs> we're we're looking you know in this day and age uh we have to be very careful about where we go and what we do um a lot of these things are financial decisions um and you know a way a lot of the bands are kind of level work you know a gig isn't just a gig a gig is you know um the rehearsals around it you know the you know the kit maintenance all this kind of stuff so we try to be very canny about what we do because we want to put on good shows. You know, we'd rather do less shows and make them good than, you know, tear around the country in the back of a transit van. So yeah, but I mean, we, yeah, we, we want to play everywhere. We want to play absolutely everywhere. So yeah, <laughs> in a word. Uh, Rick Easton, I think you've done a great job maintaining excitement and anticipating so long. Was the waiting to completely finish a bit frustrating for you? Yes, it was. Um, it was all very, yeah, it was a learning process for us as well, but it was all very chicken and the egg. But the one thing that kind of we were aware of was, you know, it's, it's like the world's kind of quite different and has changed quite a lot. So when it's like when we came back, we, um, you know, when we started putting out the singles, we had no idea what was going on. We didn't want to wait and kind of like disappear off the map completely. That's why we started putting singles out you know, quite early. But, you know, when we put um, Wonderful out, you know, that was the first song that was finished. The rest of the album wasn't done. Most of the album didn't even have vocals on it at that point. And we were very clear with ourselves that, yes, we wanted to start, you know, getting people involved, but we also didn't want to compromise. So, yes, it's been a long build up and it's been a huge learning experience for us. Um, but it was such a kind of a, a big change that we wanted to make sure we got it right. And we've been very lucky that, you know, we've got this amazing community that want to, you know, want to kind of be a part of that. So, you know, a lot of it is, you know, down to you guys. So, yeah. Um, all right, Daz. Um, from Gavin Hill. Now we know that Fierce and Dead with vocals is awesome. Are there any of the back catalog you'd like to add vocals to? um not at the minute no i don't know maybe you will you know try something one day i don't know but at the minute no it's, it's kind of that that was never a that was never an idea it was always just sort of i, I don't know yeah it just it never really occurs to us i think it's from maybe from the outside looking in we've, we've me and matt have spoken about this in a few interviews we've done recently that i think people always think that when stuff comes out that there's there's a lot of thought behind it and there's a lot less thought <laughs> about some of these decisions than you might think. Um, you know, I mean, even the decision to try some vocals on stuff was like, you know, uh, I think it was Matt's idea. Matt said like, should we try, you know, putting some vocals on stuff? And we went, yeah, right. And that was kind of it. <laughs> Roast and massive. Yes, Daz. Looking forward very much to listening to the album this weekend. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, let us know what you think. Um, Jeff, can you reveal any details about the upcoming tour? Not yet, but soon. Don't worry. Um, Lee Boot. All right, Lee. Uh, will you be going to back to instrumental after this album? Um, who knows? At the minute, probably not. We've got ideas, um, but 
yeah, it's, it's not a, like I say, none of this stuff is uh, ideological stances. It's whatever we feel like. Um, oh, where are we? That's bad news. The King's X gig didn't happen. Any possible dates in the future is awesome. Man. Oh, mate, we'd love to. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, so for those who don't know, we played a festival in Italy, um, two days prog, run by the amazing Octavia Butler. Um, and the we were booked on the Friday uh and the headlining band was going to be King's X. And unfortunately, at the last minute, they had to pull out due to some illness. So King's X is, you know, was a really important band for us, um, for me and Matt, especially growing up. Um, and again, we were talking about influences earlier. You know, there's there's definitely some of that around in, in there as well. Um, so, man, yeah, we'd love to play with them. They're so cool. Um, fortunately, uh, the mighty Hawkwind stepped in as a replacement. And we've done quite a few shows with Hawkwind and get on very well with them. So... That was quite good fun to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it was another thing in like uh, the weird, weird things that happened to you. So we were in a van, we'd been picked up from the airport um, just outside Milan. And uh, we was in a in a transit van with Hawkwind getting taken to the festival site. You know, as you do. Um Speak, uh, Ian Bradley, speaking of influences, I can hear JS back in start. The chord sequence is epic. Oh, thanks. I can't wait to hear the, the, the bass properly. I only heard on my phone so far, but I can tell it's awesome production. Yeah, that is a thing on, on phones, isn't it? Um, it? Yeah, it was just kind of th those chords just kind of, I, I, I don't know, there's obviously a lot of musicians here, but you know, sometimes where you just start playing something and the next thing happens and then the next thing happens and the next thing happens and you're not sitting there scratching your head and going, no, that's not right. It just happens. And it, it was it just felt like a really logical kind of thing. So yes, there is definitely some of that in there, um, but it wasn't intentional. It was just the whole of that track came from hitting one key on a synthesizer, which is that pulse going at the beginning. Um, and then everything else built on that. James Allen, was there anything different in the writing recording process this time around, which will carry forward to the next album? Yes. Definitely. The the one thing that we had to do because we were forced to was we stopped and we were able to a lot of time before we were writing in rehearsal rooms and then, you know, getting it to a point where we thought, OK, we're, we're ready now. And then we're, we're not very good at recording demos. We tend to just like get the tracks and then start recording them. And then you sometimes whilst you're in the studio going, oh, actually, now we're now we've got distance and we can hear it. That's not quite right. Whereas with this album, we, that's we had tons of distance we were able to redo stuff listen to stuff as i was saying earlier you know um we were able to work on parts individually and jointly and spend time with the parts and say okay well that's not quite right let's change that so yeah um we definitely want to keep doing that i mean yeah it's we we still get in the room together and you know make sure that these things kind of work you know uh and then I think from now on we'll be doing a lot more kind of demos and pre-production work. Uh, Graham, uh, how's Steve doing? Ooh, how's Steve doing? I think he's a great guitarist and him and Matt work and sound great. Steve is doing awesome, and yes, they do. <laughs> it was it was really interesting because again because uh, we we were all separate, we kind of had the mission control um kind of on on my setup on my rig here and um uh <laughs> sorry i've just seen tom's tom's message there there's a there's a yeah there's, there's a going uh, was it uh, uh uh was it going live it was a going live gag for you um <laughs> um but it was, sorry, going back to that. Yeah, it was really exciting because we were sending files to each other. So Matt would send me something. I'd work on it. I'd change it or do something. Then I'd send it back to Matt and he'd change it and do something else. And then we'd send it to Steve and Steve. So every time we were sending it around to each other, um, it was coming back like something new that you hadn't thought of. Um, and so it was like it was maintaining excitement because every time you got it back, it was like a new track, you know. And I have to say that, you know, in our... The way we write Steve um, is a bit of a secret weapon because he he always does stuff that none of us think of. So there's like this kind of like, a, you know, he's the one who sprinkles the 
you know the fairy dust on it he's, he, he's yeah he's just great um Rick Eason, easy for, for Matt Steen to suggest adding vocals when you're going to do the singing. Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, I volunteered like an idiot. I was like, yeah, all right, I'll have a go. Uh, yeah, Matt Stevens, why are you so? Yeah, exactly. Um, Dad's the Dr. Dorian spirit continues. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, a lot of us who grew up in the same hometown, we all had a, um, I say guitar teacher, that's probably the wrong word for him. Guitar teacher implies that he sort of like taught us you know like um how to play like you know blue scales and things and that was not it was it was more of a uh, i don't know how to describe it it was more like a kind of a um spiritual awakening i mean this this was the guy that was lending us Vishnu records when we were 13 and you know never told us how, how to hold a plectrum or any of the kind of boring stuff it was all yeah it was all pretty wild karen adams Hi Kev, I just want to say how much I love the new album. I play it twice a day whilst working in the office so I can give my full attention with playing it again later and we'll listen to the lyrics. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's something cool actually um, <laughs> that I kind of like uh, really used to enjoy doing was like sitting and reading the lyrics along to stuff. Um, Gary Jones, Matt Bianco, wasn't it? <laughs> I think it was them as well as Five Love. Um, Bob Rippett and you sound great. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff Mumford, are you nervous about singing live in front of an audience? Um, yes. I mean, I'm kind of, we've had conversations about this before. Like, you know, um, I think nerves are fine. And if you're not nervous, then that's probably a bit weird because it probably means you're, you know, you've been kind of uh, jaded to what you're doing. So, yeah, um, there's a few things I need to get right you know and things i didn't even think about because it's such a long time but when we played these few shows warming up who knew you know warming up your voice first who knew um and also things like making sure you know the monitoring's good and all that kind of stuff but yeah jim knight well i'll try and get to wherever you're playing see you in london see you in london jim um yeah, Bianco, you're a wanker. Five Star also got it. Highly recommend looking up Five Star on... Was it going live or was that before going live? If you're not from England, you won't understand that. What the hell I'm talking about. But look it up on YouTube. Now, it's really cool that everybody's here. And, you know, I'm really glad that people are enjoying, you know, listening and getting involved. going live there you go matt's confirmed it i like this matt's like um my um wincy willis there's a reference for you bob ripperden no chance of coming to florida as soon oh, we would love to come back to america we've only ever been once um and we would absolutely love to come back and play absolutely everywhere in america um it's difficult it, you know um They've, there's a lot of things that have, even since we we went over there for Rosfest, there's a lot of things that have changed about visas and all this kind of stuff. So it's quite difficult. Um, but the, the first opportunity, man, we'd be there. It's definitely something we're we're looking at. There you go. Matt's posted the link for you. Uh, Jeff Mumford, I'm going to play the album again after this. Need to hear it again. Good. I, you know what? I really hope. Uh, and I'm glad to hear people that, you know, you're getting repeat listens out of it. Um, yeah. Bob Ritter, cost prohibitive. Yes, yeah, to say the least. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, but it's still, you know, never say never. There's, you know, there's always ways and means. Um, uh, but it's, it's definitely something, you know, like I was saying earlier, we want to play everywhere. We want to play more in Europe. We want to play in America. We, you know, we'll, we want to play everywhere. And uh, James has provided the Matt Bianco clip there as well. So, <laughs> Thomas Hunt, I wasn't keen on photogenic love initially. It's been a grower for me. It was a grower for us as well. I I was the um I, I was the the I was like no no this is this is going to be good. <laughs> it's quite a change for us. Um, 
Deza has Winsy Willis ever been investigated? Uh, who knows? Um, yeah, photogenic level is one of the ones that we were kind of like, that's going to be, you know, quite a big difference to a lot of the other stuff. But is it is it really? Is it really that different? It's got a big riff in it. Um, Bo Hansen, even Reading. Yeah, yeah, we'll go to Reading. Why not? Tom, I'm fully grown now, love it. Ah, oh, thanks. Cheers, Tom. Uh, Matt's got a question from, I presume that's Jason Anderson. Um, I was actually thinking that a couple of hours ago, when I was listening to 6666, the bass riff section sounds like it's made for vocals. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, we've always had kind of... Um, we're not tricksy in like the, in when we're instrumental. A lot of it is not like we're not playing a, a you know a bass so that the guitarist can go ice skating on it and show off and all that. That's not what we do at all. And none of us have ever been into that. Um, so there's always been a kind of a, a songwriting sense, even though there's not been any vocals. Um, but yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll get a guest vocalist. Maybe we'll get some guest vocalists to go back over the stuff. That'd be cool. Um, Rick Eason, presumably you jump at the chance for Cruise to the Edge. Yeah, man. <laughs> Never played on a boat before, so, you know, that'd be great. Darren Landrum, did adding vocals increase how complicated it is to mix this album compared to previous albums? Yes, it did. And a lot of that came from trying to work out what the vocal should sound like. There was, um, we've had a few people kind of say back and forth, you know, that some of the vocals are quite affected and things like that. And that was partly because we wanted the vocals to bed in, to be part of it. So yeah, and and we like all that kind of you know psyche stuff. I mean, there's 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 obviously there's lots of direct stuff there as well, but you know, um, yeah, it did make it a lot more complicated. But in some ways, yeah, it gave it more of a focus as well. Bad answer. Sorry, Jeff Mumford. How's album five shaping up? Well, we've probably got enough stuff in kind of bits and bobs and demo forms to start you know um working on it properly we're hoping to yeah get get on that sooner rather than later um and that would be yeah we've been really enjoying writing new stuff um and it's it's something that never really stopped so it wasn't like you know we made this album and then was like, okay, just, just concentrate on this. We've been writing new stuff ever since. And it's got, you know, I think we've just got more comfortable with, more comfortable with doing whatever we want, if that makes sense. Um, John McPherson, play on in the Thecla in Bristol, please, if you want a nearer boat option. Yeah, like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. We love Bristol. I think we only have played in Bristol once. Stabbing the Dead Horse Tour with Knife World and Trojan Horse. Bob Ripperton, how exciting is releasing a new record? Very, for so many reasons. Um, it's exciting because we want people to hear it and we want people to, you know, um, it's like unveiling a painting or something, isn't it? You know, you, you're kind of saying, ta-da. Um, but also as well, it's exciting because it's something then that's that's out there in the world. And, you know, you can, it's like, you know, letting your children go off to university or whatever it is, you know. Um, so now we can start working on newer stuff. And it is scary too. Yeah, exactly. There's always this weird trepidation, um, like when you're there pressing the button on Bandcamp to say, go live. 
Wait up, Carl. Uh, now you've grown up, how do you think you'd react to a bottle of Avalon or White Lightning? I would be in hospital. So um, I'm sure many of you out there are aware of the the brands Avalon, Fine Wines, and uh, White Lightning. Hey, Ash. Yeah, I am all right, mate. How you doing? Uh, Jeff Mumford. Matt tells me there's a Mellotron being used recently. How's that fitting in with your style? Um, wonderfully. We love that sound. There's a great thing about Mellotrons. I know they're, they're kind of like very associated with certain things, but if you muck around with them and, you know, we like taking things and putting them through other effects pedals and, you know, messing with the sound and stuff. But there's, there's the... I, we love the limitations of a Mellotron. So any, for anybody who knows, a Mellotron is a, kind of like a... Um, a really early sampler but it was actually tape loop so you can't hold notes too long and then it drops so yeah so it's great fun Lee Boot, are you gonna have a warm-up show in Rushden before the tour yeah that'd be cool wouldn't it <laughs> never say never we're gonna go and play in Pettifers. uh there's a old school joke for you Rushden people there uh Buckethead released five on Friday wow yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not doing that. Uh, Graham said, "About to order a Chinese takeaway. What do you want?" Oh, lovely. Um, uh, Singapore style noodles, please. Um, Rick Easton, what would you do if the album really kicks you into the big time? What would you do? I mean, what even is the big time now for us? The game is to keep doing it because we love doing it and the minute it becomes anything other than that then we would stop so that's why we're very careful about what we do and why we you know we often say no to things or this that the other not because we don't want to do them or something but because it just for whatever reason doesn't work out we've all got families we've all got day jobs you know so we have to make sure that it's something that we enjoy doing um so yeah there's always that line isn't there of you know I mean, you know, our, our great friends at um, BEM, Dave, David Elliott and all that, you know, we always worked really closely with them. Everything was collaborative and we always had control, you know. So I, I don't know, big time to me always implies some kind of handing over of, of control and that, that freaks me out a little bit. Dan, any gig opportunities from really on the horizon would be a great support slot. It would be a great support slot. Uh, if anyone's got a number, give them a ring. <laughs> I think Matt did a gig once with Steve Rothery. I'm sure he's still got his number. Probably got he's got his address. Matt, go around his house. Um yeah, Ash Smith definitely do the pet shop warm-up. Absolutely. Yeah, straight in there. Rose and Crown. I mean, yeah. We'll do a Rushton tour. This is getting very Rushton centric. For anybody who don't know, we grew up in a small town in Northamptonshire called Rushton. And there's quite a few people from there here, and we're all making in jokes about Rushton. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing place to grow up very small town um kind of like a decimated by um industrialization and the you know the way that kind of broke down but it was this thing where you know uh very small town with you know four or five pubs but um well probably a few more than that but um there was about 30 bands and that's what everybody did you know you were in bands everybody hung out everybody you know that was our social circles you know it was great brilliant orange clocks have got their own cruise ship that's true they're like led zeppelin uh with the you know the, the airplane but they just take a really long time to get there uh matt's provided Wikipedia entry for Rushton. I feel like it should be getting sponsored by Rushton Council or something. Matt's saying, shall we wind up? Yeah, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go to eight o'clock. Um, it's all charity shops and takeaways. <laughs> Orange clocks are a big noise on the seven seas. Jeff Mumford, what are the chances of, of a low-key acoustic house concert? That is something we spoke about just the other week. Um, we did a gig... Um, uh, a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, um, 
the uh was it stratum house concert and that really that was really f good fun because we had to kind of reimagine our stuff and we'd love to do that with this stuff as well um and it'd be interesting as well because of the vocals and everything and how that works so yeah that'd be really good fun to do what happened to the football stadium erosion just ain't there anymore um Graham said, yeah, Matt's trying to wind up because he wants to watch Curry, exactly. A dirty match. <laughs> exactly, yeah. The Straight House concerts, yeah, uh, run by the amazing Jeff and Beth. Can't recommend them highly enough. The, 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 they're really cool. It's literally, they just uh, allow you to put a gig on in their house. Luckily, they've got quite a decent sized house. Graham, hope the house gig happens. Yeah, absolutely, man. Graham was with us at the last one we did, so yeah, it was it was really good fun. It's really fun, get, you know, taking your stuff and having to do something different with it. We did it about two years after we started, or maybe a bit longer. It was we just put more come out, and we did a gig at a festival in Crouch End called Shh, and it was all about like low key kind of stuff. Stuart was terrified because he was like, I can't be quiet. He was on brushes and everything. <laughs> I'm missing every day for this. Well, I hope I'm worth it. <laughs> well, I'm glad everybody's had a a chance to listen to it or is in the process of listening to it now and um yeah we're just really proud of it as a piece of work um it wasn't written as a as a, a to be an album but it just kind of because of the way it was written and the way it was all working together it just kind of i think it all works really well um thanks jake they are lovely stairs aren't they um yeah and it just kind of it when it was done this complete piece of work we we were kind of a little bit shocked ourselves so yeah we're just really happy that people have got a chance now to hear it and to listen to it all in one go um thank you grant yep yeah, seeing camden uh jeff Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Daz, as well. Well, this um, this has been enchanting. We should do this again. Um, next time we do it around yours, yeah? Cheers, Daz. Cheers, Graham. So uh, thank you very much. You know where to find us. You, you know you're all in the the fierce army group so if you have any more questions or you know musings it's great because it's it's great for us to you know be engaged with people and to talk to people about what we do because it's yeah it's it's great we we uh we like to think of this as like one big collaboration so yeah good fun eh great work congratulations thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much um Chinese in 10 minutes there you go Graham's got to get off so I'm going to say um see you later uh thank you so much um and we shall see you soon ciao